I've got us. Uh, I suggest is eat and move up because um, I, I, John could try and talk louder. I doubt he's going to talk louder than Well, I have this right microphone now. thing, don't I? That is right. only for Oh, for the camera. Board. Yeah, so okay. So that is, has nothing to do with projection. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, begin the presentation. Uh, let's give a welcome to John Gusselder. All right. All right, thank you for coming. Um, okay, three approaches, not three answers. It's, we're just, the people are trying to figure out origin of life. They don't know it, okay? And so I want to emphasize approach, all right? But uh, this actually has business applications. So there's money, talent, all those important things are in there. Okay, this is a least chipmunk. Maybe you've seen these around Jackson Hole. It's one of my favorite animals in this area. This is not an origin of life problem. This is a product of evolution, all right? Natural selection, genetic variation, all of that. Doing research on origin of life, it's not trying to figure out how these kind of things happen. Dif that's a different problem. We're trying to find a molecular system that can seed natural selection and get that started, all right? So separate problems, both interesting but different. Here's a chemical evolutionary tree. <clears throat> so at one time, the earth didn't have living things on it, it was just rocks, all right? But then they split, and right here, rocks and life have a common ancestor, all right? This carbonaceous chondrite right here predates the earth, that's why it's below it. Okay, and the approaches that we're gonna do first is a bottom-up approach, which is kind of the standard thing. How do you get some non-living chemicals to become living? That's that attempt. Move from the bottom up. The other approach, which is common in, in engineering, is reverse engineer it. Start with living things and try to work backwards down to here. All right? Very useful, too. These two do not meet in the middle. They're a long ways from the middle yet. <clears throat> the third technique is theory approach. And I'll explain more about that when we get there. This little red thing right here, that represents an attempt by people to give birth to something new. All right, we're not gonna talk about that, but some people are trying to make another line right here. You know, it's usually called artificial intelligence, but uh, you know, it's a new thing. It's not gonna have the same chemistry as life, but the theory part's similar. Okay, the Hadean Earth, that's the geologic period when the Earth is first formed, first few hundred million years. There's no, by definition, there's no rocks from that period. <clears throat> so there's not a lot of evidence of what happened. But there's certain things that we know for sure. Um, and, and the reason we're talking about this is when most people think life originated. <clears throat> the sun was faint, so <clears throat> Other things being equal, there would be ice on the surface of the earth. If there was water, it would probably be frozen. Uh, but other things aren't equal. There's also a heavy bombardment, meaning large foreign bodies are striking the earth, excavating the mantle up, turning the, if there's an ocean, it turns the ocean into steam. It's all vaporized. <clears throat> there's these zircons, these are min not really rocks, but a mineral, they do survive from there. And at least in one spot in Australia, they indicate there was ocean. It's just one spot, so I don't really know what that means for the whole earth. Was, you know, whether there was an ocean covering the earth, I don't know. There's other isotopes in these zircons that say the atmosphere was oxidized, meaning carbon dioxide rather than methane. Um, the lava, there's a type of lava called comatite, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, 
but just from the mineral composition, people can tell the lava was a couple hundred degrees hotter than, say, lava coming out of Hawaii right now. So the crust is hot, sun is cold, it's getting bombarded, maybe there's an ocean, maybe not. It's, that's why I put question marks right there. I don't really know what the Earth looked like. The Earth's core, most people think the Earth's core formed quickly, so the iron went to the core of the Earth before it could be oxidized. So there's more oxygen up in the crust. So elemental iron in the core of the Earth means something for the atmosphere. So the crust, not the atmosphere, but the crust of the Earth was oxygenated. So if there's a volcano, you're probably getting carbon dioxide out of it rather than methane. Um, the moon was much closer. Uh, <clears throat> maybe 10 times closer. So think of what the tides must have been like. You know, very dramatic. I don't know how long it stayed closer. People argued about that because it's not just this linear thing where it's moving out to where it is now. Um, hydrogen is lost from the atmosphere. When the Earth first formed, it probably had a lot of the elements like Saturn and Jupiter, which have hydrogen, methane, those kinds of things. But the planets that are close to the sun or small don't hold on to their hydrogen. They lose it. And as we'll see, hydrogen is, uh, is essential, really, for origin of life. Okay, so the Hadean Earth is really up in the air, what this Earth looked like. I want to look at the gas phase, meaning atmosphere. <clears throat> So this is a volcano in Chile. Um, you can see that uh, there's a lot going on in that volcano. You know, look at that lightning. Um, so there's a lot of chemical synthesis going on there. Um, this volcano has oxygen in it, but this probably, I don't know really how volcanoes worked in the early Earth, but there was probably volcanoes, probably lightning doing a lot of synthesis, right? And this is a cylinder out of a car engine this is another gas phase uh, reactor, making a lot of the same things that are coming out of here. Like, I think you'd be surprised what comes out of here besides carbon dioxide and water. Uh, which, and we're gonna look at some of them. So, <clears throat> the bottom-up approach is to take some of those chemicals in the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide is a big one, nitrogen, water, maybe methane, hydrogen, maybe carbon monoxide, and try to build complex chemicals out of it. So some of the things that are formed are acetylene, cyanide, aldehyde, ammonia. These things would come out of your car exhaust, probably in small amounts, uh, but measurable. Mostly you get carbon dioxide and water out of your car exhaust, but you get some of these things. <clears throat> now these can make this next layer of complexity, pyrimidines, purines, amino acids, fatty acids, and sugars. That's what we're made out of, these things. And you can kind of see cyanide would go right into these things. They're like polymers of cyanide. Okay, this is the first person we're going to talk about is Thomas Carroll. He works in München, Germany. He has a, a lab dedicated to working on this origin of life chemistry. And, and he did something smart. Instead of using this, trying to put the gas phase reactions in his lab in one of these kind of things, like if you've seen Stanley Miller's uh, experiments from 1950s, when he did origin of life work, it looked like this. But instead of doing that, the gas phase chemistry is well understood. Instead of trying to reproduce that, he just said, well, we know what's made there. What's interesting and what we don't understand is the liquid phase. And so he uses this thing instead, a, a Eppendorf thermal mixer. So he can put it in a, his reaction mixture in a little tube. It sits in there. He can control the temperature and stir it and he can do hundreds of experiments in a short amount of time at, at low cost compared to this thing. I mean, uh, trying to do 50 of these would cost a fortune. 
where doing 50 different experiments here is very cheap. So he produces lots of PhD students, he gets lots of funding, and, and he does hundreds of experiments figuring things out. It's not a chance thing, he just does a lot of work. <clears throat> and what he's working on, this is not the only approach to origin of life from the bottom, but it's the most common one. It's called the RNA world. So he's working on this part right here. Make these monomers that form the polymer RNA. And then later on we're going to look at somebody... John, could you speak this way instead of towards the screen? <laughs> I can try. I can try. Um, <clears throat> then the goal is to put the RNA inside a lipid membrane. Then you would have the beginnings of a cell. This idea was first put forward by these two people, Walter Gilbert and Carl Woese, I think his name is. Walter Gil Gilbert's an example of, a lot, of something that's common in uh, biochemistry. He was a particle physicist in the 50s. His wife worked in uh, Watson's, of Watson and Crick, Watson's lab at, Hartford, at, at Harvard and told him about what they were doing. And so he became a biochemist and, uh, and got prizes and had lots of good ideas. He writes good papers. The reason why people like RNA for origin of life is RNA is all throughout the cell. It does lots of different things. DNA is primarily uh, memory. It stores information. It doesn't actually do much besides that, uh, but RNA makes it is a way of transferring information from the DNA out into the cell. So there's RNA right here in a ribosome that makes proteins. There's transfer RNAs that go off and get amino acids to bring it into this ribosome. So people think RNA is a versatile chemical that could do lots of things, so they want to make that spontaneously. <clears throat> this uh, phrase, the central dogma, is DNA makes RNA, makes protein, and what some people are trying to do is say at the beginning, it didn't work that way, there was something simpler, because DNA is, is uh, uh, much more difficult. So this is what the experiment looks like that uh, uh, Thomas uh, Carroll did. He takes one of these cells, he puts this chemical right here is a key chemical, cyanoacetylene. It's a cyanide and an acetylene hooked together, all right? Because this is formed in those gas phase reactions, it, it settles into the ocean. We have that, we know that can be made. Um, you could find this in uh, uh, Titan, a moon of Saturn. You can find it in that carbonaceous meteorite. Uh, that's, those meteorites come from the outer solar nebula and occasionally strike the Earth. You would find these kind of chemicals. He puts ribose in there. He doesn't synthesize that from scratch. He adds a source of phosphate, which is uh, like uh, a mineral. It's not uh, sodium phosphate or something like that. And then this one's urea. So he puts those in that reaction vessel. He adds these catalysts. There's a sulfur catalyst, and it doesn't have to be this one, but he has to have something with sulfur. He uses different ones. Uh, it has to have a carbonate, bor uh, boric acid, borate, and here's formic acid. A catalyst means it's not, in the, it's not going to end up in the final product, but it has to be in the reaction vessel to get the product. <clears throat> These are all common in nature. That, there's nothing special about that. Borates are kind of interesting in that uh, they form complicated minerals like uh, silicate. Uh, um, and they can, some people use borates to synthesize the ribose. So that might be a future thing is to try to get the ribose and the uh, nucleotide synthesized in the same container. So he puts them in a container, puts it in this thing, turns up the temperature, 
and stirs it and comes back the next day to see what he has. <clears throat> he gets rid of the oxygen by flushing with argon. Okay, Much simpler than having that big glass globe trying to keep out oxygen. Um, so in one day he does this, the next day he can do another experiment. Or he could have, he, he, this last year he graduated five PhD students. So you imagine his lab's full of people doing things. Um, the other thing uh, that's going to come up again is there's repeated drying and wetting. So his goal is to make all four monomers that make RNA, he wants to make them in the same pot like something like nature. So he puts them in this pot, but the only way he can get it to happen is he lets the liquid evaporate. He takes the cap off the reaction vessel, basically. It evaporates, it dries down. Then he adds liquid again, and he does this a few times. It's essential. Then the next day, step, which is just as important as having good ideas about how to synthesize these uh, living molecules, is how do you know what you did? You have to be able to measure what you did. Um, you can't see it. And so he uses chemical instruments, much more sophisticated ones than people had in 1950. So this is a uh, liquid chromatography. So he would take his reaction mixture, feed it into this. This separates it based on solubility. Um, it's, the terminology is kind of like a distillation column, but instead of separating things by their boiling point, as the chemicals move through here, there's a stationary solvent and a mobile solvent. And things that are more soluble in the stationary solvent slow down. So all the chemicals are split up, and then they're fed into a mass spec which separates things based on their mass and their charge. This is a modern one, different than I've, anything I've seen, but the old style ones would just be a big magnet. The molecule comes in and depending on its mass, it curves more and strikes a detector. The other instrument he's using, this is a nuclear magnetic resonance machine. It's uh, similar to an MRI in a hospital. And that's how he can identify what he's made. Because you have to be able to prove what you made to convince somebody that you, you know, did these things. Okay, and then as a summary to what he's doing, he has this cyanoacetylene. A nitrogen source makes this compound. <clears throat> and then you can see this one follows down to the purines. This one follows to the pyrimidines, all in the same pot. And then if he adds phosphate mineral, he'll get phosphates hanging off there. You have to have the phosphates in order to hook these things together. So this is the first time this has been done, last year. This was published in November. So the 11B, 12B, these are the monomers to make RNA. Right. The reason... Um, one of the complications I'm leaving out is you get some other isomers, meaning <clears throat> this sugar, it could be hooked to a different place on here, right? So he has lots of numbers. He measures which isomers he's getting. These are the ones he wants, and he does get them. But if you're making this in nature, you get all kinds of products, not just the one you want. Okay, so, <clears throat> so as a review, Carol made these things, the monomers. To make the polymer, the RNA, you have to hook them together. And you can see the phosphates is how they hook together. So here you have a uh, pyrimidine, a sugar, and a phosphate. So RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. Here's the acid, here's the ribose part, and the nucleic part. DNA, the difference between RNA and DNA is one of those monomers is different. 
and it makes it more stable. It doesn't degrade as well. But it also makes it less usable as an enzyme in the cell. So, next step, try to make a polymer. And an old idea for this is to use clay minerals. So this, this thing right here is the clay and those monomers could attach to the clay and if they're attached in the right way they could hook together. And what, he's, what he showed here was these can attach in a lot of different ways depending on the pH and, and some people even argue there's other ways. It might be flat against the clay, is it vertical, how do they hook together? If they do hook together, how do they detach? All right. This is, this is the uh, older technique. One that's more interesting to me is this next one. David Deemer at Santa Cruz, he's doing, he does both of these steps at once. He makes the polymer and gets it inside the vesicle all at once because he uses the vesicle as the catalyst for making the polymer. Is the vesicle <coughs> something that's made? Sure, thank you. Yeah, the vesicle self-organizes. It's, it's, so, it's a soap bubble. It's a fatty acid. Um, um, the ones in living cells are, are a little more complicated. They have phosphates on the end. But you don't need that. You, can, you just need a membrane. And so <clears throat> uh, a fatty acid, just like, um, like the triglycerides that you measure at the doctor's office are three fatty acids hooked to a glycerol molecule. All right. <laughs> All right, so David Deemer does both those la second steps at once. Okay, so these are some of those uh, lipid membranes on a, on a microscope slide. And he's adding the monomers. And, as, and one of the important things here, just like in synthesizing the monomers, it has to dry. You can't make polymers in bulk water. In bulk water, the polymers tend to turn into monomers the other way. So you can't have DNA just forming out in the ocean. It's got to be in a place where it's concentrated. Like inside a cell, it's very crowded. You can make polymers there because the water's not dominating. If water's the dominant thing, you cannot make any of these interesting polymers. So it, uh, it's only going to happen in a pond if the pond dries out. <clears throat> he detected polymers up to 100 bases long using uh, um, nanopore electrophoresis. His, his, work to, uh, his, his uh, day job, I guess, was sequencing DNA, you know, which is a big business, synthesizing DNA, sequencing it, and nanopore electrophoresis, I guess, is one of those techniques. I don't understand it that well, but uh, he does. <laughs> and he measures it to be 100 is a useful number because that's actually bigger than the transfer RNAs in our cells. It's big enough it can fold up and do interesting things. What I didn't get from him, yeah, go ahead. Is the RNA single-stranded or double-stranded? Single-stranded. Um, what I couldn't get from him or anyone else is, is what's the sequence of that RNA? Um, is it an interesting sequence? Is it boring? Does, what does it do? I don't, I don't know. What is, what is an interesting sequence? I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> um, this is not an origin of life experiment. This is an engineering experiment because people want to make products. They want to uh, they want to use nucleic acids as memory devices because it's a very high density memory. Or they want to build molecular machines, structures. So these are some structures that this group made out of RNA. Uh, and they're not very long uh, uh, sequences. The, the reason you want to make structures for origin of life 
is a long strand is not going to make anything interesting. It has to fold up so then other chemicals can interact with it in some way. Like in enzymes are all folded up, other chemicals attached to them in certain ways. Here's some other RNA molecules this group made. And on the right are microscope uh, images. <clears throat> what I'm trying to emphasize is RNA is a very versatile molecule, but also people are spending a lot of money and effort at understanding them, so there's probably going to be progress on this. It's not, uh, this research is not something you have to do on your weekends. You can get grant money, you can get paid to do it. Okay, now we're going to start the top-down approach. So start with something living, reverse engineer it. And we're going to look at two examples. The first one, which is, uh, he's in the news a lot, is J. Craig Ventor. He has a company and a institute. Um, uh, he was involved in originally sequencing the human genome 20 years ago or so. That's his claim to fame. But what he's doing now, which is very interesting, he took a cell from a human intestine, one that's getting all its nutrients from the uh, intestinal fluids. So it doesn't have a lot of genes. It, gets, it doesn't have to have a lot of metabolism. It gets all the things it needs from the human host. He took that uh, cell and started removing every gene that he could and still keep the cell alive. So he got it down to 473 genes and it lives and divides. So that's the simplest living thing that I know of. You can see an application to medicine right away in that 149 of those genes are essential for life but are unknown function. All right, so big discovery right away. <clears throat> the, uh, this was just done, 2016 this was published. So, where that's going to go in the future, I don't know. What, one thing I'd like to see is, this is getting small enough you could simulate it on a supercomputer. You know, follow every single molecule inside the cell. Every piece of RNA, maybe not all the water molecules, but um, a cell is roughly, say, 100 nanometers by 100 nanometers by 100 nanometers. That might uh, fit on a supercomputer. You might be able to get it to work. So, so each you've got unknown functions and a bunch that are, they actually know the function of each yeah, yeah. one of those? Yeah. Oh God. So, and each one of these genes is making protein, is that? Right. So right. you're basically making if you were to mod proteins. Right. If you were to model this, you'd have to model at least a couple thousand chemicals. Hmm. But that's probably doable on a supercomputer. <clears throat> So each one of those genes makes a messenger RNA, so there's going to be 500 of those. The, all the transfer RNAs, the, the proteins for like the ribosome, uh, or not proteins, but the RNA for the ribosome to make proteins, make the cell wall, divide, and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the other thing it has a lot of is uh, transporter proteins. They're things that are in the cell membrane to let stuff in and out because it gets all its food from the outside. It doesn't make it. Um, he wants to make a flu vaccine. So he makes money at this. He'll do things in the future too. Our flu vaccine's made by this archaic method right now, which, which we all learn about every year. Okay, the next, the next result to me is much more interesting. This is by James Farrell at the Center for Systems Biology at Stanford. He, I called it zombie cells because he takes living cells from a frog embryo and kills them, homogenizes them, separates everything out, and brings them back to life. Okay, these slides are from his paper. They're a little technical, but uh, um, essential. So he's taking the frog embryo cells, puts them in a tube, homogenizes them, tears them apart, puts them in a centrifuge that can go to uh, 12,000 G. So it must be a very big expensive thing to, you know, uh, 12,000 G. So at that high of uh, force, 
it can separate the cytoplasm, the nuclei, the, all the organelles of the, that fluid. All right? He throws out everything but the cytoplasm. So the, the guts, I guess. There's no nucleus. And he puts it in a slide, a microscope slide. And he has a very fancy camera that he can uh, take photos of that. So that, these are photos through a microscope. And the first thing that he sees, which is mildly surprising, is the cells reform. So this is the cytoplasm originally. It forms new cell walls. All right. And what's going on down here is uh, people have these uh, fluorescent labels they can put on, a, on a different parts of a cell. Like there's a fluorescent label for a ribosome, one for the nucleus, one for microtubules. So like this little blue one, that's a nucleus right there. Okay, so the cells came back to life, which is, I mean, I didn't, I was surprised at that. But this is what's really surprising is now, <clears throat> so here's that same experiment again. This one, there's no nuclei. He's removed all the nuclei, it's just the cytoplasm. And it still reforms into a cell. There's no proteins being made. It's the, it's self-organizing. All right? Is it alive or is it? Well, it's, I don't know. Okay. Is it, is it I'll, sh I'll show you one thing. It's going to do stuff, too. So it can't reproduce because they took the nucleus ah. out. No, let me show you. <laughs> okay, next slide. This one's shocking to me. Okay, <clears throat> this is lots of the different, Im this is the most interesting image. These cells have no nucleus. They're dividing. So <clears throat> here, here's this cell, it divides. Then this one divides divides again. So this one goes through about seven divisions. No nucleus. It's not synthesizing proteins. I had to read this twice before I even believed it. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a little, sh little shocking. This is the chemicals that are needed. Um, and the way he tells, determines this, he can put chemicals in there to block certain things to know they're not happening. What it has to have is ATP, which is the energy source in living cells. And it has to be able to make microtubules. Um, one thing about um, ATP, this is that monomer in RNA, adenine, right there. Adenine, the, that monomer in RNA, shows up all over. NAD, FAD, the uh, citric acid cycle. It's involved in metabolism, too. It's a general purpose thing. But this is all it's needed to make that cell divide. So this is really a target for make a computer model of it and see how that's happening. But the, the message is that cells are self-organizing. They don't need to be managed. There's not an executive director, all right, or a president of the cell, all right? It just does it on its own. Well, you need the energy source. You gotta have energy, yes, yeah. And the, the energy source is the ATP, ATP. Right, right. I also wonder if is it, is it just randomly a certain number of a whole bunch of them would reproduce as opposed to all of them, or almost all of them? There, well, the whole slide is reproducing. Oh, then, okay. It's not just here and there. Not just here. Okay. Here, let me... Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> see, like here, these four, they all divide. Wow. And it fills the cell. <clears throat> what, what's the timeline? This is 194 minutes, so three hours. Are those cells, I mean, they look like they're different sizes. Are they more or less in the identical to the parent cell? They're a little smaller. Like, here's the original cells. Yeah. You can see these look like about a quarter of the size. Mm -hmm. Do they grow after they're that size? <clears throat> I don't know. Um, 
And so these cells have the ATP in them when this whole experiment sure. starts. Sure. It's in the cytoplasm. Right. It's part of what they've cured. So eventually it's got to stop. But I'm surprised there's a, it, it must not take a lot of ATP because it keeps going for several divisions. I don't know. Um, and I threw this tubulin uh, and microtubules are the targets of Taxol and Colchicine, two uh, important uh, drugs. Colchicine is used in plant breeding to stop the cell from splitting so that you can make a plant embryo polyploid because most of commercial plants are polyploid like wheat is has six copies of its DNA so if you have some plant and you you want to commercialize it some people do this and make it polyploid I'm surprised it's legal but um, okay now we're going to the theory approach which is a little trickier but um, let's see if I can this to work. Are you going to talk about the uh, thermodynamics? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a, yeah. Okay. okay. So, <clears throat> one of the things in a textbook that can really throw people off is every image is static. You see these structural drawings. But living things, as we all know, they do stuff, right? That's one of the fundamental definitions. It's got to do stuff. So that's why I put that in there. This came from that database there. They have, like the other thing besides this embryo, uh, the cells multiplying, the next stage is something called uh, gastrulation, where that spherical ball, it kind of folds in on itself, does this dramatic movement, um, all on its own, self-organizing. No one knows how. <clears throat> okay. So here's the whole, in one slide I have all of theory of science. Um, um, so <clears throat> there, here's theories about symmetry. So electricity, relativity, quantum mechanics, things you would call um, uh, laws of nature. I don't like the word laws of nature because uh, young people always want to know then, well, what happens if you break the law, right? So it's, it's not the best way to describe it. Um, so everything's symmetrical. Uh, and the way that, the way this is taught now, symmetries lead to conservation laws, which in turn lead to equations of motion, all right? But you cannot do anything with an equation of motion until you have an initial condition or a boundary condition. And that's what leads to all the interesting things that we see around us. Like the most interesting initial condition, of course, the one that started the universe. All right? In other words, <coughs> uh, laws of physics are not enough to get the world. You have to have an initial condition or a boundary condition. Okay, very mysterious thing, to me anyway. All right. We're going to look at less mysterious ones like origin of life. Okay. If you start things in an unlikely initial condition, you know, not the most random one, then you can get something called symmetry breaking. So an egg is fairly symmetrical, a fertilized egg. It's not perfect, but this is definitely not a sphere, right? So that's the origin of the term. You're breaking the symmetry. There's other examples of this, which we're going to look at. So convection, turbulence, lasers morphogenesis, all examples of that. All the interesting things that you see around us in the world. These two figures played an important role in it. Alan Turing, he did morphogenesis. He's famous for other things, but... And Emmy Norther, uh, some people call it Northerr, I guess that must be a German pronunciation. She is a Jewish-German mathematician living around 1900. Um, and at the top of theoretical physics. I don't know why she's not better known. She, of course, got kicked out of Germany. <clears throat> and then at the bottom, you see conservation of energy comes from symmetry. But this other concept that's a little harder to grasp called entropy, 
which no one ever talks about in school. Like elementary school, you don't ever hear that word. Really? Or I didn't. Did you? Not elementary. Not elementary, no. <laughs> in I didn't know what entropy was till I went to college. Entropy always wins. The, um, and entropy, like a lot of times entropy, you'll hear the word disorder. But that disorder is kind of a value judgment thing. It's better to think of dispersion of energy. So entropy is like, you could have the energy concentrated in one ultraviolet photon. That photon hits a rock and it disperses in 100 microwave photons. It's dispersed. That's a one-way process. You never get 100 microwave photons to hit a rock and have an ultraviolet photon come back out. The same with gas molecules. So, <clears throat> and it's all back to that initial condition. If you start things in a unique initial condition, it will evolve to a more random one. That's all the second law and entropy are about. But if you, <clears throat> and, and this caused people a lot of problems. I should say, this slide took 300 years for people to come up with. All right, it's difficult. And the, the symmetry breaking in entropy was very difficult for people because around 1900, they viewed the universe as, as this, harmony, this thing in harmony who had no beginning, no end. All right? It didn't have a beginning. But, but entropy, which chemists would see all the time, if you follow entropy backwards, it leads you to an initial condition, which we now call the Big Bang. So it's, it's, uh, it confronts that view of the never-ending universe, saying, well, that's not going to work. So there was a lot of resistance to this idea, and it's why it's still not in elementary school. Okay. So treat life as an, an example in a category and look for some other things in the category um, to see wh what is generally true to get some ideas on how to make life what, you know, you're, you're grasping at straws, basically. So, <clears throat> so, this is a fluid moving through a pipe, and it hits a little cylinder right here, and it makes this structure all on its own, all right? It has a regular pattern here. Later on, it becomes chaotic. The thing that... Uh, well, I'll get to that next slide. This one, this Petri dish has something like an oil with metal filaments in it, and it's being heated from the bottom and cooled on the top, okay, like the earth, roughly. And convection cells, each one of these is a little convection cell, forms spontaneously on its own above a certain temperature gradient. This is a, another Petri dish with a chemical reaction in it, and spontaneously forms these patterns. You, you know, most people when they're doing chemical reactions, whether it's in an academic lab or an industry, they stir it, right? So you're not going to see this. <clears throat> Otherwise, maybe it would have been discovered earlier. But, you know, chemists stir things. Um, so what do they have in common? What do those things have in common with original life? And they're spontaneously self-organizing. There's high energy flows. You can't, you can't really see that in this image, but there are high energy flows, high entropy production, nonlinear dynamics, and feedback. And we're going to look at each of those a little bit more detail. So the, the invisible hind, hand behind these structures is their steep gradients, which can't be dispersed by diffusion. So in the flow in the pipe, so you start out, you have a momentum gradient. It's faster in the center of the pipe, it's zero at the boundary. As you make that fluid go faster and faster, diffusion can't move the momentum down fast enough and it starts to loop. If you could increase the viscosity to make it all move as one, then you can prevent those things. So you have this conflict between the viscosity and the gradient of the momentum. In the, <clears throat> in the convection cell, you have a gradient of temperature and you have thermal diffusion. So heat's going to diffuse away from, like a bubble rising, heat will diffuse away. And the relationship between those two can create these 
loops. The chemistry one's a little tougher to grasp, but I, I just put it in there. I don't expect anyone to get that in one slide, but you have diffusion of these chemicals. There's more than one chemical, and if the reaction's happening faster, then the diffusion can move something away or bring something in, you'll get a pattern. If diffusion's very fast, like if you're stirring it, you're, do, you're, you're doing manual diffusion. But if you don't stir it, then you can get these kind of patterns. Okay, steep gradients exist in nature. These aren't necessarily the ones that would be at the Hadean Earth, but uh, these are ones I can get pictures of. But the thing, uh, uh, these are two that people do research on. So that alkaline vent, steep under the ocean, where the hot mantle and the cold ocean are kind of in contact, all right? And then, of course, this is Yellowstone, where you have hot lava fairly close to the surface. The <clears throat> one of the nice things about this one over this one is here you can have heat drying, wetting and drying. And we saw in making the monomers and making the polymers that drying is an essential step. <coughs> uh, he has a, a theory about how this one works, but he hasn't shown that it works. This is Nick Lane's group. He's making an artificial alkaline vent. Um, but he hasn't shown that it can make a polymer because the whole thing's fluid. Like here's some of the details of it. Um, so <clears throat> in that alkaline vent, it's kind of got a cellular structure, that, that uh, tower. And there are thin layers of iron sulfide and on one side you have fluids coming up from the, the crust and on the other side you have the ocean but it's water everywhere, and I, d I don't see how you're going to get polymers. He says that there'll be hot spots and cold spots in the, the, that gradient. You can get polymers in the cold spot, but he hasn't proven that. He hasn't actually made anything. Where people have made plenty of polymers using the wetting and drying technique. So does the drying concentrate it? Is yes, the yes, the yeah. The, to make the polymer, um, when it dries, then the polymer is favored. And then when it's wetted, it brings more reactant in, more monomers. Then you dry again, you lengthen. So <clears throat> if you just put RNA in a beaker of water, it will turn into the monomers. So, <clears throat> so to make, the alkaline vent is really nice for lots of reasons for making things. But uh, I, I don't see, you, you know, I'm waiting for him to explain that. Okay, here's an example of a nonlinear device. Okay, this valve right here, this is just like the valves outside your house where you hook a garden hose. The f as you open the valve, so this is turns through the valve, or no, this one's turns of the valve. This is flow through the pipe. In other words, it's linear it would be a straight line. It's not a straight line, it's nonlinear, all right? Now, if you take that same valve, and take the output of it and feed it back to a control thing for the valve, then you can get oscillations, right? Do you see that? So as the, let's say the pressure increases right here. The pressure increases and you design this so when the pressure is high, it shuts the valve. So then it closes the valve, pressure drops, all right? Which doesn't sound magical or anything, but <clears throat> the magic comes in is, what if you have a thousand of these valves and you start connecting this pipe to some other valve, not this one. So you take the output of this valve and connect it to the control of another valve and you have a thousand of them. Then you can get patterns in space. And in fact, you can do that with digital circuits fairly easily um, and it's called a neural network in some cases. So this simple idea right here is very creative for making spontaneous structures, all right? This is, if you do the electronic version of this, this is a triode or a, or a transistor. But these things happen everywhere in populations, all of that. Okay, so now I'm gonna look at a 
nonlinear oscillation in a cell. Cells divide. Well, like the first slide we saw in the theory part was a cell dividing every few minutes. And this guy over here, Paul Nurse, he got a prize because he found the chemicals in a cell that did that oscillation. And this guy made a mathematical model of it. And I'm not trying to explain that model, just that these are proteins inside the cell, and this is their measured oscillation. And the cell division will follow that. So this is like a circuit. That's all I want you to get. People explain this with a circuit diagram. All right? And now I want to show a more complicated, realistic circuit. So these Japanese scientists, they synthesized a strand of RNA that had uh, 144 genes. They just made one up. And they made it up to make a, a particular enzyme that would in turn synthesize that RNA. So you have these two chemicals that make each other. All right? And they put them in a, a cell membrane and, and uh, built it. Uh, which is interesting in its own right. I mean, this is kind of an intermediate. It's, it's built out of, they, it synthesized the RNA, but the cell functions on its own. But here's an, uh, a kind of abbreviated schematic of what they think is going on. And there's actually much more complicated versions of this. So it, it's like um, 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 we're going from a triode to a complex integrated circuit. And so it's going to be... Uh, like you could get to the point where you get something uh, uh, you made life, but you don't really know exactly what's going on unless you had a very big computer and you're following everything. You know, it gets very complicated. Like what's going on inside your computer? We don't know. I mean, you know, there's millions of transistors. And so it will get like that. This is a simple one, 144 genes. So like that one cell that, uh, uh, that we saw earlier had 400 and some. So this is a uh, self-contained system that is continuously operating and yeah. oscillating back and forth? And yeah, yeah. It's remaking itself. I mean, you can't say it's origin of life because they made the original RNA. They had to seed it. But what you'd like to do is get something like that spontaneously. So the the RNA over here, it synthesizes the enzyme. The enzyme makes another copy of the RNA. And they're putting energy in it in some way. Sure, it's in a bath of, of media. I don't, I don't remember Heat all the details. Yeah, well, it probably has ATP and all that. I don't remember all the details. I just, you know, uh, before I started doing this slideshow, I didn't know any of these things were being done. They've kind of surprised me. You know, things have changed a lot since 1950, I mean, obviously. <laughs> but, you know, the reason I... Uh, but, the, but if you read a popular science article about origin of life, they start with this Stanley Miller thing in 1950 and sometimes end there. That's the only thing they talk about. Um, okay, last slide. So this is the thermodynamic view of a living cell. You have a low entropy feedstock go in, high entropy waste go out. And the, the total entropy of the surroundings and the cell increases. Inside the cell it's decreasing, but the surroundings increase. So it doesn't violate second law in any way. The cell membrane, the whole, cell membranes do a lot of useful things, but one of the things they do is create a boundary here where you can make low entropy inside and a mess outside. So in a sense, you could say pollution's built right into this. Well, one of the interesting, there was a, there's a, um, a lot of discussion about this issue about entropy and, and what, and, and, and how uh, dispersion of energy, as you're talking about, favors life, because life dis yeah. does a great job of dispersing energy. So the highest form of life, it, it, reactions that favor life are favored because they disperse energy faster than non-life. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so these type of reactions that John has been talking about 
are actually favored uh, uh, for thermodynamically than non -blowing. Just Just like the convection, the convection and the turbulence, um, they, they're unavoidable. Whether life's unavoidable or not, I don't know. So, uh, I really haven't seen uh, like a proof that it has to be that way. No. But, but it sure, you know, when you look at this, some people um, that work at big universities like MIT or Stanford, they'll say that this is going to have to happen on another planet that has this same chemistry. It's not like a one in a million thing. If you have a planet with this chemistry somewhere out there, this is happening. What evolution does, that's a different question. You know, whether it makes chipmunks or not, maybe not. Uh, but that simple cells probably are very common in the universe. Two, two points. You, the general topic you're talking about here I guess you'd call it like autogenesis or autogenesis, life yeah. creating itself. And then on several occasions you mentioned boundary conditions and triggers. Can you dismiss or do you have to accept the possibility that there were triggers of some kind during the evolution of life? Well, there definitely were triggers. There definitely were initial conditions or boundary, like, like, uh, like a good example in evolution is uh, natural selection is very fast at coming up with something. What it can't do though is change the chemistry of the earth easily. So it has to live within the constraints of the chemistry. So at the beginning of the earth there's no oxygen. It has to live in that constraint. When oxygen became common then all of a sudden natural selection produces a bunch of new things. And so that's like that. The boundary condition changed. My thought on natural selection is that would be the refining mechanism. You've got something that started off, but oops, it reached a roadblock. And natural selection told, told it to go a different direction. Now, what I meant by triggers or outside influences, if during that natural selection and development, something was added to the system, you know, from the outside, like an asteroid or something, or a crashed intergalactic spaceship DNA. Sure, sure. That's not origin of life then, though. No, that but it's, it's development of life. What, uh, see, the reason I didn't point that out, or th I don't even think about that much, is because it's saying life originated somewhere else and it came here. And the interesting question is, how do you make life? So I would want to, well, how did it get made over there then? My, my comment is that it didn't necessarily make life, but it sure might have changed the direction of the development of life. Sure, and, that, and, and what you're getting back to is, what was the early Earth like? And, and we, we have limited knowledge of that. Um, it'd be nice to know more. Like, like on the surface of the ocean, say around a volcano, was there this organic carbon sheen, uh, like an oil slick? And was, that, was there enough carbon that it's just piling up, let's say? Or was it all in a carbonate? Was it all in the atmosphere? Like if there was an oil slick kind of thing, then it's easier to imagine, you know, you have the heat and energy from a volcano, the drying, something's happening in that oil slick. Uh, but maybe it's not there, I don't know. It, it seemed like it would be hard to make, I mean, you can make methane, but to get bigger hydrocarbons, like petroleum or something, that, that's, the, uh, that seems hard to do without it's been feed stocks. Right. It's, it has been done, um, and people know a lot about it because it's been used, done commercially. People uh, in Germany... do it? That would be great. In Germany and South Africa, they took coal and turned it into a gas and then would take the gas to make the products, kind of like I showed. Uh, it's something called a Fischer-Trope synthesis. Because they couldn't buy petroleum. Right. But, but what it did is it created a lot of knowledge how simple molecules can be used to make big ones. And the tricky, trickiest molecule turned out to be those monomers of nucleic acid. The fatty acids they can make, the sugars they can make, it, but it was those making one pot of those monomers of nucleic acid. That's why I focused on that. And that's why I didn't discuss all those other But you can make amino acids. Um, um, the fatty acids, uh, uh, all those things can be made 
I, I don't know if I should say easily, but they can be done. But well, didn't the Uri Miller experiments make the precursors to amino acids? Yes, they made several of them, like at least a dozen. Uh, but even, uh, I think it's the Mur Murchison meteorite. Uh, it's one of those carbonaceous, uh, I might have that wrong, but definitely the carbonaceous chondrite meteors, which uh, are coming from the solar nebula before the planets form. They have amino acids in them, they have uh, fatty acids, they have hydrocarbons, all those things. Um, that's, why, that's why I was kind of focusing on the RNA hypothesis because things in nature, like the Titan atmosphere has a lot of these chemicals too, things in nature uh, are giving us evidence that that works. So that's a good, like one of the things I didn't discuss at all was amino acids. Um, but amino acids are commonly made in nature uh, uh, abiotically, without life. And so maybe they're going to play a role too. But um, um, I just focused on a few things that seemed simple to me and interesting. Right. So the most revolutionary piece of your talk would be to say that they can now, from simple ingredients, make the four bases of RNA. Exactly. Like I think that and the, and the, the phosphate group and the sugar group. Right. So I think, and I think what this will do is it will encourage those people that were making the polymers to keep at it. Let's keep researching this because now this one sticking point is solved. So this whole uh, hypothesis is is worth pursuing again with more energy. Yeah. Sure. Well, <clears throat> like in that f the when I was talking about the Hadean Earth, um, let's get back to the beginning. See that part where it says hydrogen lost from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. If if you don't have hydrogen, and and it's not just the atmosphere, you can make hydrogen. Down at those alkaline vents, hydrogen is produced. So you can make hydrocarbons at those alkaline vents. I just don't see how you can make polymers. But you have to have hydrogen, and, um, and you have to have probably a solid surface. Like, I don't see how you can make polymers in the atmosphere of Jupiter, let's say. Um, so you have, you have these constraints. You have to have reducing conditions, methane, hydrogen, something like that, which you get further from the sun with bigger planets, but you have to have a solid surface with water, which you get closer to the sun with a smaller planet. So there's this range where it's going to work. Um, um, so Mercury, Venus, and Mars do not have hydrogen. Like, uh, the, so unlikely to have life. But Venus has all this water vapor, I thought. It doesn't, I don't think it has, water vapor much. It has a lot of carbon dioxide. It, it lost all its water. Yeah. So, okay, got it. Yeah. It, it's, it's it, like... It's driven off. It has a, a, a runaway greenhouse effect, which is going to happen on Earth, by the way, eventually. But uh, yeah, but that's, it's almost all gone. But it probably started very similarly to the yeah. Earth. Yeah, it's because in the beginning, all those planets had some hydrogen. You know, maybe in the form of water or methane, but they had some hydrogen. But they lot, it takes mass to hold on to it, a magnetic field, and some distance from the sun. And there are probably hydrogen compounds that have hydrogen in, uh, in um, Venus right. and, and Mercury, but not, not, not very. Not gas. Yeah, but it's um, not enough to, to make it work. And, but <clears throat> when you look at the, uh, you know, the data for the uh, planet, that aren't in our solar system, it's, it's clear there's going to be large numbers of them. So there'll probably be many planets that are in that range where they have the hydrogen. They have a solid surface, they have hydrogen, so it's, it's probably common to have single-celled life. That's my guess. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a chemical Goldilocks zone, not just a temperature one. Like, and, but it's, it's a little trickier in that um, 
you have, it, it looks like you have to have a magnetic field. So you have to have plate tectonics with convection. So uh, it would be possible to be at the same radius as the Earth and have a dead planet because it didn't have <coughs> plate tectonics. Why do you need a magnetic field? To protect it from the solar wind. So the, the reason you lose the hydrogen it's because you're in the interior of a planet. Like, you know, you, you talk about these moons of Saturn where if there's life, it's not on the surface, it's miles underneath. Right. They but, would be shielded. But they're shielded because they're far from the sun. If you took mm. Titan and put it close to the sun, it's not going to have an ice shield anymore. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, where Earth is, it's just getting into that range where it's going to be icy. But if you had a planet right where Earth is, it didn't have plate tectonics the same size, it, it probably would not be able to hold on to its hydrogen. Because there's an, a very intense solar wind bombarding. And I don't, I don't understand the exact mechanism how this works. But it's not just gravity that holds the hydrogen, it's, or, or lack of gravity that causes you to lose it. The solar wind is blowing it away. Yeah. The solar wind's made of a lot of protons. They hit it and knock it out. Hydrogen. Yeah, and so they both go flying out. It's not like one leaves and the other one stays. They both go flying out. And like when I was reading about this one, how fast, people look into the mechanisms pretty carefully because they want to know, did the hydrogen leave in 50 million years or 500 million? If it was around for a few hundred million years, it makes a lot of difference. Well, that's, that's an interesting discussion about Mars, because Mars probably once had water and hydrogen. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's been uh, some of the, uh, um, the MAVEN satellite, I guess, that's been study, has studied the process of solar, the solar wind stripping out the yeah. uh, hydrogen from Mars. Mars has no magnetic fields. So that's also yeah. correct. It couldn't uh, keep it the... It's, it's, it's in trouble in two ways. It's small mass and no magnetic field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but like I said, that those uh, um, astronomers are finding lots of planets out there. There's probably going to be planets in the correct zone. It will probably be common. Probably more planets than there are even stars. Yeah. Yeah. On the average. Multiple. You know, to partially answer your question about uh, origin of life too. It takes, uh, at the beginning of the universe, there was only hydrogen and helium. So all the other elements, like carbon and oxygen, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, didn't happen immediately. It happened over uh, 10 billion, you know, 13 right. billion years. And our, our sun is considered a third generation solar star because the stars <laughs> created all these elements. And it took several generations of stars to take all this hydrogen and helium and make something other than hydrogen and helium. And so right. the, the, our solar system is one that has all these heavy elements in it. Uh, so it's, it's unlikely we had life before we generated all those elements. Yeah, yeah, because uh, you didn't have any carbon, no, right. no oxygen. No. But like the other thing you could see in his experiments making the monomers was metal atoms are important. Like, uh, like all bacteria are filled with metal atoms in their enzymes. The active center is a metal. Like in hemoglobin, it's an iron sulfur thing. And, and in the, the bacteria that fix nitrogen have to have uh, nickel, I think it is, or maybe molybdenum too. So you have to have metals, you have to have carbon, phosphorus. The, phosphorus. <laughs> like Phosphorus is kind of interesting. Uh, like the nucleic acids have the phosphorus in it, and the phosphorus doesn't damage the carbon part of the molecule, it doesn't oxidize it. Like if you use sulfate, it would oxidize it, but the phosphorus is water soluble, so you get this very stable thing that makes it water soluble. Because, you know, most hydrocarbons <coughs> do not dissolve in water, they'll separate out. And so uh, it's a good combination. This is somehow related. A few years ago, when we were driving to Pinedale in the morning, just after the wildlife bridges were completed, we came upon this massive herd of antelope on the other side of the fence, on the south side of the fence. And they couldn't figure out what to do. And we think we were the first ones to see the first antelope go over the bridge. Uh -huh. And there was nobody else there. We thought the news would be that, you know, the uh -huh. came and fished. We just watched in amazement. 
and uh, the first one went, and then another one, and then they were off. And we were wondering if we were witnessing any influence on DNA. Is there a relationship between behavior and uh. DNA, or DNA and behavior? Is it possible that the offspring of those antelope, well now that's their way, and uh, they won't know any other way. Does that influence DNA in any way? Well, natural selection certainly does. For example, the antelope that run onto the highway and get killed, they don't produce offspring. So that's the way, that's the, way the DNA has changed. It's not, it's not the DNA is learning. It's that the animals that don't figure it out die before they produce offspring. And so, so it's a slow, inefficient process, but it, you know, over a billion years it can do something. So the DNA that exists in an organism is fixed? Yes. Life, yes. Necessarily control its actions in the future. <clears throat> yeah, it's fixed. Um, it can be modified and read and all that, but it's not like... cancer. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not like uh, that if you do something right, somehow chemically it goes in and changes your DNA to make you a more uh, longer living organism or something. It's just death. I mean, it, um, you ha the, the organisms have to die in order for natural selection to work. Or reproduce. Yeah, they have to reproduce and die. <laughs> in, in other words, like in an insect that has a lifespan of a week, natural selection can happen much more quickly. So out in a field, you have an insect infestation. You spray it with an insect killer <clears throat> that kills 99.99%. So you have one in a million left. By the end of the growing season, you can have a whole field full of insects that are resistant to that insecticide because they have a very short lifespan. Right. This is why bacteria Don't are so good. Right. right, they have a 20 minute right. lifespan. Right, they can really figure so out this. So you can see that happen uh, in a short amount of times if you have short lifetimes. So but if you introduce stem cells as a medical treatment or whatever as they are beginning to are altering DNA. Sure, you can synthetically alter DNA. Yes. So in the case of the antelope, what we saw was it was a female. She looked at the situation and had never seen that kind of situation. Was the same. She looked at the situation and evaluated enough to influence the whole world. Right. <laughs> you mean you might live? <laughs> so, so do you have magnetic fields on planets without plate tectonics? Because the magnetic fields are basically because you have circulating uh, magnetic well, materials. I didn't want to get into it, but magnetic fields are one of these self-organizing structures um, that come yeah. from convection. Right. You, you, in the, you have a convecting uh, conductor. You know, uh, and so you can have uh, a spontaneously formed magnetic field. Um, if you have circulating. If you have a rotating fluid. That are magnetic. Or that are, no, that are conductors. Okay. It just has to be a conductor. All right. Um, and, and there's little mechanical models of this. So you could look up on Wikipedia. You can see a self-generating magnetic field, a little device. Um, so you have to have that. You have to have a fluid conductor, I think. That's moving, but that doesn't mean you that's have convecting. Plate tectonics. Well, but plate tectonics is convecting fluid. I mean, a little more than that, I think. But well, plate not plate tectonics just means it's convection. You have uh, you have convection and it's forming a and that the shell, the, the, the plates are actually moving, interacting. Sure, but I, t I mean, that's details. <laughs> a consequence of, of all this material yeah. below. Yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if any of you have read uh, Dan Brown's book called Origins. I've got it. You have it. Well, 